Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. I have finally put down Baldur's Gate to, to come back and record a video for you all. Not the video I was expecting to record as my first video back after a little bit of a hiatus, but here we go. We finally got news on the future of Overwatch Esports and our first uh, look at the new Overwatch Esports ecosystem. Alongside the blog post, which I am going to go through in this video, and I'll also link to it in the description, there was also a video that they released that I will also link to in the description, where uh, Zoe talks with the development team and they talk about it a little bit. So, link to that in the description if you want to watch that and get the explanation from them here, a bit of a different perspective, but pretty much everything they talk about is going to be in this here blog post, so I'm going to go through it share my opinions, and we will see how things go as we move forward. So, the new Overwatch Esports ecosystem, this is just kind of their uh, intro to it, but as they say here, Overwatch is a competitive game at its core, it's fast, dynamic, and at its best when two teams closely matched are battling it out for victory. And the goal for the development team is to ensure that all of our players have the opportunity to experience the thrill of competition from the highs and lows of organized group play to the excitement of watching the world's best players competing at live events. And they talk about the philosophy moving into the next chapter of Overwatch Esports, which is that they want it to be more open with anyone able to participate. It's always on, regionally focused, providing experiences for participants and fans alike. And they want to make sure that everyone can enjoy it. So... This is where we get the Overwatch Champions series, which is the future of Overwatch Esports. So let's dive into it a little bit and talk about it, um, and talk about the future for what we can expect for Overwatch Esports. So, here we go. The Esports effort in 2024 will be multifaceted, and the first program that they are excited to introduce is the Overwatch Champions Series, OWCS. The OWCS is our new premier international competitive circuit open to players across North America, EMEA, and Asia. The 2024 season will feature multiple competitive stages where each region will have its own set of open qualifiers, giving players the ability to form their own teams and battle it out for their place in the main event. The stages will culminate in two live in-person international events, bringing the regions together for the pinnacle of Overwatch play on the largest stage ever for Overwatch Esports. And then we're going to do a bit of a deep dive here in a second. But let's start with this, just this little chunk of text first and, and try to break down kind of what we can. The, the number one thing that jumps out to me first and foremost is that there are three regions. We have North America, we have EMEA, and we have Asia. Basically the same regions that were in the World Cup, minus one glaring exception, which is South and Central America. There is no mention anywhere in this article, I've read through it, uh, of South or Central America. I do want to jump in and say, because I don't mention this later in the video, I did not read this specific part of the FAQ, but under the question, am I eligible to compete in OWCS, they mention exactly what countries are eligible to compete in the different regions. Um, I will talk about Australia later in the video, so I'm not going to mention it here. It is not included on here, which is a problem. But in the North America region, they do include Argentina, Belize, Bolivia, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Ecuador, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Jamaica, Mexico, Nicaragua, Paraguay, Peru, Puerto Rico, Uruguay, the U.S., and Venezuela. So South and Central America will be included in North America. Very, very good. Uh, but of note, in Asia, it's just South Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Macau, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand. So no China, no Australia, no New Zealand. Okay, there we go. That's all I wanted to say in this little interjection. Maybe they will be allowed to compete in the North American region. I haven't seen uh, anything that says whether or not that is the case. I would assume probably not. But they do say that there is... It is a multifaceted uh, esports thing in 2024, and this is the first program. I assume one of those programs is going to be the return of the World Cup. I would be shocked if the World Cup doesn't come back. It was incredibly successful this past year, 
It was a phenomenal event. So I expect World Cup to be one of the things that comes back. I also expect something like Calling All Heroes to return uh, as well. They talk about it a bit in the video, just the fact that things are going to kick off after the current set of Calling All Heroes events ends. So once again, I assume that we're looking at things like that being a part of it, uh, potentially collegiate, another part of it. There is a, a bit of a mention of some collegiate related stuff later uh, in the Asian region. So I think there is some stuff to look at in terms of what we know already is going to be there. But like Contenders is gone, I assume, tier two, because it's all one connected scene. But we might have stuff like Calling All Heroes and Collegiate that kind of help uh, form that that broader circuit. But I suspect that the idea of contenders and the tier two scene as we know it is probably gone uh, because teams are going to be basically going from the bottom and working their way up. Um, but the exclusion of South America and Central America seemingly in this uh, is bad. Now, maybe Central America is included in North America. I don't I don't know what their uh, regional kind of specificities are. Um, and I guess we'll figure that out as time goes on, but that is definitely something that hurts. There's always the possibility that part of the greater, uh, ecosystem are other events to kind of help rebuild South America and Central America. But I feel like you just need to include them in some capacity outside of just World Cup. Uh, but maybe we'll learn more about that later on in the future. I wish we had gotten news about that because to me, they're talking about how we're bringing it back to global, we're bringing it back to the communities, yet they're still ignoring South America, which has been uh, a huge part, especially look at Valorant, right? Like Brazil is incredible in Valorant. They have been one of the best countries at producing talent and really good teams in Valorant and Overwatch seemingly uh, not including them yet, but we'll see what happens. I'm not going to sit here and, and judge them fully on that because we don't know the full extent of it. This is just the first look we have gotten at where things are going. But I do like the the idea of letting teams form more naturally. Um, I think there is going to be uh, organizations that get involved. We're going to see franchises that are created and, and are built up. And, you know, we've heard that Misfits is still interested from people who now formerly work at Misfits, but Misfits has obviously been interested. I wouldn't be shocked if NRG is still interested. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see kind of what happens, but I, I think it'll be more like what happened in the early days of Valorant Esports, where players form teams, organizations kind of sit back and see what happens, see what teams play well and look good. It's a little different than it was in early Valorant, because Valorant was a new game at that point in time, and so no one knew exactly what players were going to be very good at Valorant. And then that's when teams started jumping in and, and poaching those good rosters. It's possible that teams would just right off the bat start building rosters to compete in these events. Um, before they go into it, but you look at something like Flash Ops where you had all these teams that were formed, those are probably a good sense of what some of the early teams are going to be, and that exists across North America, EMEA, and Asia, so you already have at least some idea, but some of those organizations I think are just going to stay together and just compete to get uh, in these events. But let's start by looking at NA and EMEA and the format for them. You can see there is a multi-week format, starts with a Swiss bracket or Swiss stage, moves into a group stage, and then a double elimination main event bracket with eight teams will be the kind of main thing. So as they say here in NA and EMEA, teams will participate in four competitive stages throughout the year alongside the two international OWCS events. Uh, which I think they'll talk about that later on in this article more in detail, but that's one in May and one, I believe, it's later in the year, I think it was like September or October, I don't remember exactly when, but one was in May and one was in the fall. Each stage will feature an online open qualifier and main event where players can earn circuit points, which are used to determine international event qualification. Players can earn circuit points through top finishes in each of these stages, the more points a team earns, the higher they're standing on the leaderboards and seeds going into each event. Um, real quick with this point, the fact that they say players can earn circuit points is is odd. The concern I have, and this is something that we've seen happen in contenders and we see happen in, in other esports, is what is the, the core of the way that people earn circuit points? Is it based on a team or is it based on the individual players on the team? So 
for example, right? Let's say, and I imagine it's based on a team, but like, let's say there's a team that forms, that does well in, in one of the first events, um, but say they aren't super happy with the play out of their main support, and so going into the next event, they change their main support player, right? Does that player who was on the team and is no longer on the team keep those circuit points and gain points to qualify? And would that mean something along the lines of the player, you know, does then the new player that joins have no circuit points based on the way the other the rest of the team had performed? I, I assume it's not going to be an issue. I assume it's going to be based on like the team itself. But how do they determine who gets those points? Is it one of those things where like, hey, we have a team, we got picked up by an org, we are moving those points from that name to this new org? I'm sure it won't be a problem, but that's just the kind of thought I get reading that. It's just worded in a strange way. I imagine it won't be much of a problem, but you never know. Uh, sometimes weird stuff happens with formats like this. As I said before, the OWCS stages in NA and EMEA will feature three unique tournament phases, Swiss, groups, and the main event. The open qualifier will contain the Swiss phase alongside groups, which qualifies teams to the main event. The Swiss phase will host a maximum of 512 teams to qualify 16 teams into groups. These 16 teams will compete in groups of four with the top two teams from each group advancing to the main event. At our eight double eight team double elimination regional tournament, all run through our new partners at Face It. They go into a bit about Face It here. We knew about the Face It news. The ESL Face It news had dropped a while ago. It was that the NA and EMEA stuff would be with ESL Face It, and the Asia stuff would be with WTG. 100% confirmed now that we do know that those are the partners for these regions and for these groups. Uh, I like this format. I think it's a good format. I, I think this is a really good way to do it. It's very similar to what you have with a lot of other esports. It's similar to what we had with the Flash Ops event uh, at the end of the year last year. So you'll have that kind of open, just so many, a bunch of teams that just play a bunch of games. And then the best teams from that open qualifier go into that group stage uh, to really kind of figure it out. And to see what teams are really, really good. Um, for, for me, when I look at this and just kind of think using my content brain of what I probably will talk about, I probably won't do videos on the Swiss stages uh, just because there's 512 teams maximum and a lot of them are going to be not very good. So most likely what I will do uh, when we uh, get into this OWCS and we're getting into the type of content I'm going to make just to kind of give you where my brain is at, I probably will start by looking at the group stage and looking at how teams performed in the Swiss stage. So say, okay, here's this team of, of the 16 teams in this group. These are the teams that did well. This is what their record was. These are their head-to-head -head matchups, stuff like that. Um, and that's how we'll, we'll, we'll go in terms of how I talk about the, the teams and as we kind of go forward and look at everybody. Um, because obviously I'm not going to sit here. If we're talking about 500 teams in NA, 500 teams in EMEA, I'm not talking about 1,028 different teams. Even talking about 32 teams gets to be uh, a lot at times. So it'll be much more focused on the, the bigger teams, the bigger mainer events when we get into the, the group stages. And then, of course, the main event as we move into uh, this part where we have eight teams. That is more my focus, I think, as we go forward. Because the round robin is going to be a nightmare to, to talk about every single team. So I would not put myself through that. Uh, but there's always interesting things to look at. And with an open circuit, you're going to get more kind of interesting players who maybe get picked up from, from a team that doesn't perform super well. But if there's some DPS player who's popping off for their team and is like hard carrying this team that has no right to be any good to like some performances, you might see them get picked up. So it's obviously worth keeping an eye on, but... The Swiss stage is going to be a lot of very one-sided affairs. It's probably going to be first or two, I would imagine. It's not going to be a first or three type of thing. Uh, but here we go, Face It. If you're not familiar with Face It, uh, they work in both uh, NA and EMEA. They are, I believe, owned by Saudi Arabian back... Uh, maybe even the government. I, I don't know exactly. There's a lot of stuff there. I know that people have kind of concerns about that. Obviously, we saw how big Saudi Arabia was in the World Cup, so... There's always going to be, I think, concerns uh, involving that, uh, but we'll see what happens going forward. But they're very big, especially in Counter-Strike. That's kind of where they've been making their name in the past. 
I also think that what's interesting about this is um, it, it's a platform. It's again, it's like another th- like a separate kind of like platform that exists outside of the game itself. What that means, right? They say here, a streamlined Overwatch 2 face it experience will be the official way to play in the Overwatch Champion series starting March 1st. What I think this could mean, because they say here their platform provides an open infrastructure that enables all players to find a network to connect with competitions, teams, brackets, and standings. This means that we can, will most likely see a face it driven uh, in game kind of tournament structure that is, you know, separate from the game itself. So it's not an in-game tournament client, but it means that anybody can participate in tournaments that exist on the ESL slash Face It platform. So for all the people who want a more kind of solidified, more robust tournament structure and tournament system, this will most likely provide that for you. So if you're really, if you want like the real competitive experience of a tournament where you play and you win and you, I don't know what you would kind of get out of it. That is what this is most likely going to provide. So that is a huge thing if you're someone who's really interested in that side of it and the competitive system in Overwatch just isn't enough for you. This will most likely provide a way for you to get that real kind of hardcore tournament, hardcore, like I want to win something that matters than just see my number go up and my rank go up. I want like real, real deal stuff. That's what this will provide for you. The interesting format, much different from the NA and EMEA one, is Asia. So this reminds me quite a bit of what we saw with the Flash Ops event, like I said, with NA and EMEA. Very similar in this case, where you have three sub-regions within Asia. You have Korea, you have Japan, and you have Pacific. Uh, We know that there is progress. I don't even remember exactly. I think Overwatch is back in China, or there at least is a a deal in place. I know there was news about that um, with the kind of reconnection, I think, with NetEase and Blizzard now that Bobby Kotick is gone and everything that happened there. I remember seeing something when Bobby Kotick was removed and I think we are going to see, hopefully, um, it come back. So, in 2025, we may have a Chinese subregion again. I think Chinese teams will be able to play in Pacific, especially if, you know, let's say by June, after the first round of qualifiers have happened. Uh, I could definitely see them, especially if you have a wild card, right? I could see them saying, you know, we're going to introduce, you know, Chinese teams can participate in the Pacific region. And then maybe in the future, there will be four subregions, and they'll take a couple of spots and, and change them up. Maybe they'll do two from each. Maybe they'll do three from Korea, uh, two from <laughs> Japan, two from China, one from Pacific. You know, who, who knows? There's, there's going to be a lot of different things that go into play there. And, and the who knows? Maybe they bump it from eight teams to 16 uh, when they do the when China comes back in. But it's interesting. And only two teams, as you can see, will move on from the Asian LAN to the international event in with with um, DreamHack. And I think that applies to both the middle of the year one and also the final one at the end of the year. But I'm getting I'm getting sidetracked with that reading this to hopefully make things make more sense. As they say here, a key benefit of having a new international program with distinct regions is the ability to better provide players with experiences that best serve their unique regional needs. As such, the Asia region will look a little different than NA and EMEA. It'll have three different subregions, Korea, Japan, and Pacific. Each subdivision will host multiple tournaments with formats tailored to each local audience, all with the direct purpose of qualifying teams up to the OWCS. I don't know if Australia and New Zealand are included in Pacific. I don't recall if that was the case in... I don't think... I think Australia had its own thing going with Flash Ops. I could be wrong, but I don't think they were included. So I don't think... Australia might not be included here either. Um, There is a 
Australia is interesting in the sense that Australia is very far from other things. So typically part of the reason why Australia and New Zealand have kind of had to be isolated is because latency is always a problem. So I would wonder if maybe they will have a separate thing as well, or if they'll be included in Pacific. We don't know yet for sure. Uh, that'll be interesting to see what happens there. Because uh, I, I, I'm genuinely not sure, but potential for Australia and South America to be kind of excluded from the OWCS, which would be unfortunate. But I, like I said, I don't know yet. I will wait and, and see what happens as time goes on. But as they say here in Asia, teams will participate in two competitive stages throughout the year, with each stage culminating in a respective international OWCS event. Each competitive stage will be operated by WDG, with each subdivision featuring their own respective open qualifiers leading into regional tournaments. These regional tournaments will then determine the best teams from each of our subdivisions to advance to the two OWCS Asia Championship tournaments throughout the year. At each OWCS Asia Championship event, fans can watch their favorite teams from across all of Asia in person as they compete at the WDG Esports Studio in South Korea for their spot at our local, or sorry, at our global events. We'll move down to talk about Wara in a second, but much like how ESL Face It is the partner in NA and EMEA, Wara is the one in Asia, and they have some other things that they have going on that they talk about a little bit later. But let's take a look at the Asia format here for a second, just to kind of really, really get into the way it's going to work. So as you can see, they have four tiers of events, and it's going to start with the open qualifiers in all three regions. So, oh, actually, it says right here what the Pacific region is. So it does not include Australia. Uh, it includes Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, Philippines, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. So not even China is included in the Pacific, which is interesting. I guess the game's currently still not available in China, but I'm sure there are ways to get around it by maybe relocating to Hong Kong or Macau, since those are a part of China uh, politically. But I digress. You have the three open qualifiers that will then move into your overall kind of events, as you can see here. So the top nine teams from Korea will move into a LAN, the top nine teams from Japan will move into an online qualifier, and the top eight teams from Pacific will move into a, an online qualifier. Then, as you can see, there's this wild card which happens after these have finished. So the top three teams from the Korean LAN event will move on to play in the Asia LAN with the fourth place team going into the wildcard event online. Same with Japan. Nine teams will compete. The top two teams from Japan will move on with the third place Japan team going into the wildcard. And then in Pacific, top two will move on. Third place team goes to the wildcard event. So as you can see, that gets seven of the eight teams qualified there. And then the winner of the wild card event where the fourth place Korean team, third place Japanese team, third place Pacific team, whichever one does the best there will move into the final spot here in the LAN WDG Esports event. Most likely, let's be honest, most likely that'll be a fourth Korean team. Obviously it's not guaranteed, but that is most likely what will happen. And they, they clearly know Korea is right now the top region. And it'll most likely be four Korean teams uh, that would do the, the best in this event. And then the top two from the Asia land move into the international event. Which feels low. Um, it makes me think that there might only be six teams. Uh, I don't know if they had the number up here. They don't. So they don't actually say from... The North America EMEA ones, how many teams move on? If it's only, there's a very real possibility that it's only one, but I, I imagine it's probably not. It's probably two from each, which would be six teams total. Now, maybe there will be a further wildcard event internationally, but even then, that feels like not a lot uh, of teams to participate. And then, here we go, international events live at DreamHack. We are thrilled to be partnering with DreamHack with their festivals having served as epicenters for competitive gaming for many years. 
and they will be having tournaments at two east, uh, locations, one in DreamHack Dallas, May 31st through June 2nd, and then it'll be in Europe in Stockholm, which is going to be interesting to see. Now, like I said, this doesn't say how many teams will play and advance, just uh, that there will be events in Dallas and Stockholm. We know of at least two teams coming out of Asia, which feels like not a lot, uh, but I suppose based on where they are, maybe that's the reason why. I, I don't know. That'll be interesting to see. Maybe their thought process is Asia has such a already has like a regional LAN event here that they can get away with only advancing two, but even then, eh, that feels odd. Maybe we would like to see more. Here we go, though, in some of the other events that are going to happen. You have North American EMEA. In addition to OWCS, players and fans can look forward to many other ways to engage in Overwatch Esports with initiatives through Face It. They don't have any news on what they are, but there will be other ones. Like I said, probably other tournaments and smaller scale stuff that anybody can compete in. And then in Asia, we do get news on two things. We have the WDG Cup, which offers a unique knockout competition that is open to all teams in the Asia region and will run during the OWCS offseason for Asia. So that'll be a way to play even when the OWCS isn't going. So that'll be probably big events, big tournaments uh, in between for some of those teams to play in. And the WDG Scholastic Tournament, which will be a regular competitive opportunity for collegiate, high school, and middle school students, which is going to be cool. Tournaments will take place four times annually, and that way they can compete, which is going to be really, really awesome. So here is the map, uh, and we'll kind of go into some of this. Here's the roadmap of when things will happen. So November actually is when the finals are, which is interesting because that's around when BlizzCon <laughs> happens. <laughs> So maybe the World Cup won't be happening. Maybe it'll be replaced. And it's going to be in Stockholm, so it's not going to be at uh, Anaheim. So who knows? That'll be interesting to see. Maybe it'll be much later. In, I don't know. Who knows? But as you can see here, the first WWCS Open Qualifiers will kick off in NA and EMEA shortly after the 2023-2024 season of Calling All Heroes concludes in February. The competition starting in March. And Open Qualifiers for Asia will kick off in February. So here's... A nice roadmap where you can kind of see what's happening. If we can base, if we base things off of last year, I think there's potential for World Cup in June and July. The the qualifiers and the wild card stuff, all that stuff happened around this time of the year last year. So maybe there will be a big World Cup thing going on here, and then it'll happen again in November, and maybe the finals will be after BlizzCon, because BlizzCon is the beginning of November, so maybe the this major finals will happen late in November. I don't know. But there we go, you kind of see the map here. NA, EMEA, you're going to have the qualifiers and Stage 1 main event happening in March, and then the Stage 2 qualifiers and main event happening in April, and then you get your international major in May. In Asia, stage one qualifiers, the round robin and last chance, which I assume is the wild card, uh, and then the playoffs, stage one main event, majors, break in the summer, and then resume again with a similar format later on. Though I suppose the qualifiers and main event will be a little bit more spread out than that one. I guess it's more just uh, probably late September into early October. So there we go. That's what we have now. Um, Will there be viewership incentives? There you go. In-game rewards. We got it. Will there be live competition? Yes. Where will Overwatch Esports be streamed? We don't know yet. What is Face It? All that stuff. So there we go. Lots of news about Overwatch Esports. I mean, there's a ton to dive into here. I could probably make several videos uh, as time goes on. My initial uh, reaction is this is about what I expected from it. This is really similar to, to the format I would have expected us to get. More international stuff, more open circuits. I think the exclusion of South America and Australia pretty notable uh, and potentially China as well. Though China, the exclusion is much more based on the fact that the games are still not available there. Hopefully that will change soon. Like I said, there has been a bunch of news about that. But this is the first time we've gotten anything in a while and so it's nice to at least get some news. 
and I'm excited to kind of see what teams we start to get uh, in March and see where things go. But uh, yeah, this is a long video, so I think this is probably a good enough spot just to end. Uh, like I said, link to this article in the description, link to the video that they put on their YouTube channel uh, for the Overwatch Esports in the description as well. Let me know your thoughts on this. Are you excited about this? Is this a format you expect to be better than the Overwatch League or you're more excited for than the Overwatch League? Are you tentatively excited? Are you fully excited? I'd love to hear from you in the comments down below. I'm really interested to see where this goes. I'm obviously... I've been a huge fan of the Overwatch League for a very long time, so seeing the Overwatch League no longer be a part of the future of Overwatch Esports certainly does hurt a bit. But I'm excited to see where this goes, and we're getting international events. Um, we'll wait for more details on terms of how many teams are going to be competing and all that type of stuff and, and stuff like World Cup. Still a lot of questions. Um, you know, I, I'd say this gives me more questions than it does answers, but at least we have some answers, which is better than where we were where we had none. Uh, and that's the reason to be excited. So yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below if you are excited for more Overwatch Esports and Overwatch Champions series content in the future. Consider liking and subscribing. Uh, and we're going to continue this journey as we go. Um, it'll be exciting. It'll be fun. And uh, we'll see where things go. But yeah, that's it for today. Thank you all once again. And uh, hope you're all staying safe and staying healthy. And until next time, bye-bye.